So we, we were looking at these three algorithms, gradient descent, momentum based gradient descent, Nestor accelerated gradient descent and I know you are waiting for more algorithms, Adam, Madagard and so on. But in between I took a slight detour which is I went to the stochastic and mini batch gradient descent, mini batch versions of these algorithms and we understood how they operate. And before I go to these advanced algorithms, in today's lecture I want to do two more uh, modules. One is on adjusting the learning rate and momentum, some tips for doing that. And this, I will return back to this at the end of all the optimization algorithms. Once I finish all the optimization algorithms, I will revisit this part. And the second module that I want to cover is on uh, something known as line search, right. So both these are the two things that I will cover today and we will end this lecture there. And then in the next uh, week, I uh, will talk about some of the other advanced optimization algorithms, okay. So let us start with this tips for adjusting the learning rate and uh, momentum. Uh, yeah, right. So now we were looking at gradient descent and this is where we had started, right. This was our first loss function where we started on this very flat uh, plane, right. And then we argued that when you are in these flat surfaces, the gradients are very small and hence your updates will be very small and you will get stuck there. And that was the motivation for using momentum and Nestrov and so on, right. But you could have also argued, right, that instead of using momentum or Nestrov, I could have just used a larger learning rate, right. So if I would increase the learning rate, even if my gradient is small, it the gradient multiplied by the learning rate would still have been a large quantity and I would still have got the effect of moving faster, right. And it does make sense, a right? learning rate is how fast you move, so maybe that would have helped. So now let us see what happens if we had gone by this intuition and set the learning rate to 10 instead of 1, right. And it is uh, like 10 times what uh, I had set it otherwise, right. So let us see what happens in that case. So my learning rate is set to 10 now, of course it is moving fast, but then again you see the problem of oscillation, right. So it kind of uh, on this, you want it to be fast on the gentle places, but you do not want it to be fast once it enters the valley, right, because on the steep surfaces anyways the gradient is large, so it is going to move fast, but now we have multiplied it by the large learning rate and hence you see that there is this oscillation effect, right. So we do not really want that, right? so just increasing the learning rate is not really the solution always, right. And what we want is something which kind of adapts to the uh, slope. If the slope is small, then you want a larger learning rate. If the slope is large, then maybe you want the learning rate to uh, decrease, right. And this is exactly what we will see in the advanced opt optimization algorithms, which will be have an adaptive uh, flavor uh, to them, right. Uh, so, but for now I just want to mention that it is not just about increasing the learning rate, you cannot just set it to be a high value always, right. So that is not uh, right. So that setting the learning rate to a high value is not the right thing. And then what do you set the learning rate to, right. So here are some tips. So what we uh, typically try to do is that uh, at least, so now uh, you just let me just kind of step back and contextualize this, right. So nowadays like for most uh, areas that you would work in, right, suppose you are working in machine translation or say automatic speech recognition or text to speech, you would be building up on work which is already been done, right. So you would already have these transformer based models, someone has trained it for many languages and so on. So you would have a fair sense of what were the hyperparameters they used and you would try to follow them and just experiment in a small window around it, right. But the tips here are for the more generic case where you are looking at something new and you do not really know, no one has actually looked at the kind of data that you are looking at or the kind of application that you are looking at. Now how do you uh, set the initial learning rate, what is small, what is large, you do not know that, right. So that is the context in which I am saying this. But for most practical applications, if you are working on these standard problems, as I said machine translation, speech recognition, image recognition and so on, then you would have something to refer to in the literature which would give you a ballpark about what the learning rate should be and you would follow that close, right. So that is the best thing to do. So that is the first tip. This tip is more for cases where you do not have anything to go by, right. So what you would do is you will try to try, you would try different learning rates uh, and on a log scale, right, 0 0.0001, 0 0.001 and so on, right. And then you will run uh, the training for a few epochs with all of these algorithms. You will not do the full training. You just run it for a few epochs and you will observe the loss, uh, how the loss behaves, right. And based on observing this loss uh, curve, you will get a sense of which is the best uh, learning rate among these four or five values that you have chosen on the log scale. And now suppose point 0.1 turns out to be the best learning rate, that means the loss 
uh, the behavior on the loss function. So, you could plot how the loss is decreasing uh, from one epoch to another or from one update to another. You can keep plotting the loss. For some uh, learning rates, you will see that the loss will increase right? because these are probably very high learning rates and you are quickly overshooting the minima and then going into high loss regions. And for some learning rates, it will smoothly decrease. right? So, those would be the good learning rates and let us suppose 0.1 is one such good learning rate, then you will do like a zoom in around this 0.1. Right? So, maybe you can do a more linear search around this now. So, if 0.1 was good, maybe try 0 0.05, maybe try 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Right? So, all of this is of course, just heuristics. Right? There is no clear winner strategy here. But what you need to take away from this slide is that it might happen that you just set the learning rate to some value and you see that your algorithm is not converging, your loss keeps increasing, then you will have to kind of experiment a bit around it and this is a good way of experiment. You just try a few different values and then narrow down on what a good value is and then just maybe zoom in a bit around that. Right? So, that is one. Uh, the other is uh, as you initially when you start off, maybe you do not know anything right? because the weights are completely random. So, may you some learning rate even slightly higher might work, right? but as you have started moving towards the uh, minima, you do not want to retain a very high learning rate, right? because then there is always this chance of overshooting the minima. So, they, you should do what is known as anneal the learning rate, right? which means keep reducing the learning rate as the training progresses. right? So, one strategy there is to use what is known as a step decay and you could use some fixed number of epochs. Right? After every 5 epochs or 10 epochs, I will keep halving the learning rate. So, as your training is progressing, your learning rate is becoming smaller and smaller. So, you are making more conservative updates, especially when you are closer to the minima, you are not making a large update so that you cross the minima. right? And your approximation for, hey, I am close to the minima is just that, hey, I have been training for 5 epochs now. So, maybe let me just reduce the learning rate. So, you are just using the number of epochs as an approximation for how close you are to the uh, minima that you want to use, right? Uh, reach. Another strategy is that, you keep the learning rate, uh, you had finished one epoch, you compute the loss over your validation data. right? So, you have the training data using which you are training, keep some data aside and now after you have done one epoch, calculate what the validation loss is and let us say the value is some x. Okay? Now, with the same learning rate, run the second epoch. right? So, now you are uh, you have already computed some values of the weights, you have made a lot of updates after one epoch and you have some value of w. Just start from there, run the second epoch and keep the same learning rate and at the end of this epoch, again look at the validation error. So, the validation error is also decreased, that means things are going fine. right? Your training error is definitely decreasing and your validation error is also decreasing. So, maybe this learning rate is not so high, you can continue with it. But if the validation loss starts increasing, right? Then what would you do in that case? Uh, let me just illustrate this, what I mean. Right? So, this is a good validation loss. Right? So, it from after every epoch, your loss, when you are checking the loss, it is decreasing. Right? And suppose you were here now and you, so say this was epoch 6 and now you ran the 7th epoch okay? and you calculate the loss again and it was actually increased. Right? So, what will you do now? You, you had, you are of course, saving the weights after every epoch. So, you will throw away all the updates that you have done in the last epoch, reinitialize the weights from what they were in the sixth epoch, half the learning rate and then run this epoch again. right? And then hopefully, the loss would decrease. It is still possible that the loss still increases. That means, your learning rate is still high. So, again throw away all the updates, go back to the value of the weights that was there at the end of sixth epoch, half the learning rate again and then continue from there. Right? So, this is like more data driven learning rate that okay, my validation loss is increasing. That means, my training is not helping me to generalize well. So, let me just not make up aggressive updates because my updates are according to the training data, not according to the validation data. So, let me not make aggressive updates and one way of ensuring that is to just halve the learning rate and then run again. Right? And if it keeps increasing after that, then maybe you have just conversed and you should stop training at that point. Right? So, that is one strategy for annealing the learning rate. Another way of annealing the learning rate is to use an exponentially decaying learning rate. So, you have some initial learning rate and then you keep exponentially decaying it. Right? So, what is happening here is that you are having 1 over eta 0 uh, raised to k t. Right? So, at time step 0, suppose your eta 0 is 1. Right? So, at time step 0, 
and let us assume that k is also equal to 1. So, suppose eta 0 equal to 1 and k is also equal to 1. So, at time step 0, this would just be 1 over 1. So, your learning rate is 1 and as the time steps keep increasing, your learning rate will keep decreasing exponentially. Right? So, that is uh, one simple thing to do. But here the issue is that now, what is the initial learning rate? That becomes a hyperparameter. That was anyways a hyperparameter. But in addition, this k and this k controls how quickly it will decay. Right? So, if you use a very large value of k, it will decay very quickly. Right? So, you would see something like this. If you use a, a smaller value of k, it would decay more smoothly. Right? So, now what is the right value of k? That also needs to be determined. So, this makes it even more complex. Right? So, I typically do not uh, recommend uh, this to be used. And there is another way of uh, doing this exponential uh, learning rate, uh, which is to use the 1 by t decay, right? which is again similarly, you had some initial learning rate and then you divide it by the number of time steps that you have done so far and again k helps you decide how fast the decay will happen right so again you have this k to decide which makes it a bit uh, tricky right so again this any kind of this exponential decay uh, which introduces this parameter k which controls how fast the decay will happen is again tricky to fix right because you could have different values of uh, k so my personal uh, choice is always to go by the validation loss and decrease the learning rate if the validation loss is increasing right so that's the first uh, method that we had looked at right now similarly you could have adjust the momentum right and for momentum there was this uh, method suggested in uh, this paper and this looks very uh, complex equation but it is not really very complex so let's try to decode what it is right so there's a log here so let us and this t here, the t stands for time step. So at time step 0, you would have log of 0 plus 1 and log of 1 is 0. So this term would disappear. So we will just have 1 minus 2 raised to minus 1, right, which would just be 0 0.5, right. And this says minimum of 0 0.5 and beta max. So beta max is typically one of these values. Uh, so it would be uh, uh, or even 0, 0 means there is no momentum of course. So, beta max would be one of these values. So, now in this case it would be minimum of say 0 0.5 and 0 0.9. So, your momentum would be around 0 0.5. Okay. And as you keep increasing, now at time step t equal to 250, uh, this would evaluate to log of uh, uh, 1 plus 1 which would be log of 2. So, this would become uh, 1. So, you will have 2 raised to minus 1 minus 1 which would be 2 raised to minus 2 which would become 0.25. So, this would be 1 minus 0.25 which is equal to 0.75. So, it would be minimum of 0.75 and beta max. So, again beta max if it is something in the range of 0.9 then this would be selected. right? And now, you can keep substituting the values of t. So, now if t is equal to 750 then this would be log of uh, 3 plus 1 which would be log of 4 right? and that would be 2. So, this will become uh, 2 raised to uh, minus 3 which would be 0.125 and then this would become 0.875. So, as you can see, you are slowly increasing the uh, momentum uh, term, the beta term, right, which is the amount that you should uh, give to the history, right. Beta tells you how much weightage to give to the history. So, as you are training is progressing, you are planning to rely more and more on the history and less on the current update and that makes sense right? because now if you are close to the minima and then one faulty update will take you away from the uh, minima. right? But whereas if your history is uh, pointing in a certain direction, you would like to rely on that because over a large number of updates you have reached in this region. So, you want to give more weightage to your history as opposed to the current update. So, what this is doing is as your training progresses, your beta value increases right? and uh, as the beta value increases, you give more and more weightage to the history. Right? And in the initial phase, you do not want to give a lot of weightage to the history because your history is still building up. Right? Your history is as unreliable as the current update. Right? But as the training progresses, you want to give more value to the history. Right? So, that is the tip for uh, adjusting the momentum. So, this is uh, currently all I have for tips for learning rate and momentum. As I said, I will revisit tips for learning rate towards the end of this lecture again. So, the next thing I want to do uh, is talk about line search. Uh, this is again a simple uh, idea. 
Now, the whole uh, issue that we have is that uh, if you choose one learning rate, then you are kind of married to it. Either that learning rate is good, then you would progress well. If that learning rate is too high or too low, then either you will keep oscillating. If it is too high or if it is too low, then you will not be making fast movements, right. So, instead of sticking to one learning rate, why not try a bunch of learning rates, right. So, that is what we are trying to do here that you are trying different learning rates, okay. Now, you compute the derivative and your w t plus 1 is equal to w t minus eta times the derivative, right. Now, the derivative of course, does not change, but you can plug in different values of eta. You can plug in the value 0 0.1, you can plug in the value 0 0.5, plug in the value 1, 2, 10, all of these values, right. And for each of these, you will get a new value for t w t plus 1, right. So, this would be w t plus 1 corresponding to eta 1, another w t plus 1 corresponding to eta 2 and so on. So, now, we have found a new value for weight and not just one new value, you have found a bunch of new values each corresponding to a particular eta. Now, plug in all these values in the loss function, right. So, all of these values you could plug in into the loss function, all the different w's that you have computed and now, whichever w gives you the minimum loss, you pick that up. So, what you have done effectively is that you have tried different learning rates and you have made an update. So, you got a bunch of updated values. Now, you are looking at each of those values and computing the loss and whichever update, updated value gives the minimum loss, you are retaining that and throwing away all of that. And then again doing the same in the next iteration. So, the derivative only gets computed once because that does not change, but you just use different learning rates to come up with different updated values and then select the best updated value based on the loss. Right? So, that is what you do in uh, line search you have a bunch of learning rates and you do not get married to one learning rate, but just try all of them at every stage. Of course, there is a complexity here involved here that if you are trying 10 different learning rates, then at every step you are kind of computing 10 values. So, you have to do 10 times uh, the work just in that update equation and then compute the loss again and then select the best one, right. So, that is an additional complexity that you have, uh, but as you can imagine this would definitely be good, right. So, in the flat surfaces, you might end up choosing the larger learning rates and in the valley regions where already the slope is steep or when you are entering the valley, in those regions, if you have a high learning rate, you know that your loss would increase because you would overshoot the minima. Uh, so, in those cases, the smaller learning rate would get selected, right. So, you are kind of in some sense making it a bit adaptive based on which region you are in, right. Uh, the flip side of course, is that you are doing a lot more computations. Okay, so, let us see what happens when we do line search. So, you see what happened, right. So, the gradient descent was moving at a certain speed, it is taking more time to converge, but the line search, you can see that in the flat regions, it was able to move very quickly and it also did not overshoot, right. It did not go out of the valley because in the steep regions, a smaller learning rate would have worked and it would have not selected the larger learning rate, which would have taken it out of the valley, right. So, it kind of works very nicely and it of course, converges much faster than the gradient descent, which was used with a fixed learning rate of 1 in this case, right. So, uh, I think that is the, that advantage of line search is clear, right. So, that is all I have uh, for uh, today. Uh, we are uh, just go over, going over the slides, the convergence is much faster. Uh, we see some oscillations, but these are not as bad as uh, what we had in momentum and nag and overall the line search worked better, right. So, that is where I will end uh, for today and in the next week, we will uh, see uh, some uh, 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 variations of a gradient descent algorithm, which use an adaptive learning rate, okay. So, I will see you next week. Thank you.